Hello everybody and welcome back to our series of videos on projections and datums. So today we're going to talk about datums. A uh, quick recap though, let's, let's review what we've learned so far. First, all spatial data have some coordinate system. That's what makes them spatial. And if that system is on the curved surface of the planet, then it's considered unprojected and the coordinate units are in degrees. Latitude measures the angle from the equatorial plane, and longitude measures the angle from the axis that connects the north and south poles. Now, latitude and longitude do a great job describing position on the planet, but this coordinate system makes it difficult to do common analytical functions like calculating distance and area. And this leads us to projections. This means to take the curved surface of the planet and make it flat. Now you can't do this without distorting the data, unfortunately, and there are three projection surfaces that we often project onto. We've got planes, cones, and cylinders. All of these can be unrolled to form a plane. Now any projection surface can be either tangent or secant, depending on whether the projection surface only touches the surface of the planet or actually intersects it. Then there are some mathematical projections that are conceptually similar to projecting onto planes, cones, and cylinders, but they don't exactly fit that definition. Now, projection distortion. Distortion is always minimized at or near the intersection of the projection surface and the planet. So if we got a cone sitting on the planet, the distortion will be minimized where that cone actually touches the planet. Now, different projections cause different types of distortion. And we choose a projection based on what type of distortion we want to maximize accuracy in, in our analysis, and whether we want to make a an aesthetically pleasing or convincing map. There's four types of projection distortion that we usually care about, and we generally choose a projection that minimizes distortion in one type while sacrificing accuracy in the others. And these types are shape, area, length, and direction. Projections that maximize accuracy and shape are called conformal projections. Those that maximize area are called equal area projections. Those that maximize length are called equidistant projections. And those that maximize direction are called azimuthal or true direction projections. And just to clarify, equidistant and azimuthal projections do not produce true distance and directions everywhere on the map. They only work from a specific point or along a specific line. Now, in ecological research and management, most work I see is done in either UTM or state plane projection. And when you're working in an area smaller than a few hundred miles across, then both of these projections cause you to be very near the lines of intersection of the cylinder and the planet. Therefore, they do a good job at maintaining shape, area, distance, and direction within the small local area. Now, if your analysis area is larger than a few hundred miles wide, you're going to need to use a different projection, and you'll have to accept greater distortion. All right, enough introduction. Let's move on to something new. Let's talk about datums. So all our discussion about projections, they all make the assumption that we actually know what the true shape of the Earth is. They also assume that we have a latitude-longitude coordinate system that can accurately map it. But this raises a question, what is the actual shape of the Earth? So we, we have to have something to project, right? So what is that thing that we're going to project? Well, think about that. The most obvious answer would be the actual true shape of the planet and there is such a thing and it's measurable and this thing would include mountains canyons it would include ocean surfaces the problem with this object is that it is just too complicated to work with it's so complex that they just bomb your computer out if it ever tried to reproject that entire thing every time you change the map frame plus it's just changing all the time every time you have an earthquake it changes shape a little bit got the tectonic plates rotating and shifting around, plus you got erosion changing the surface. The true surface of the planet is just not a steady and constant thing. So we look for other options, and there is this possibility called the geoid, which is pretty interesting. This is the surface of constant gravitational force perpendicular to the direction of gravity. Now what does that mean? Think about it this way. So you know how gravity gets less the farther away you get from the planet until at some point in space you're weightless? 
Well, this range of gravitational values implies that there are an infinite number of surfaces that represent constant gravitational force, each perpendicular to the direction of gravity and each nested inside the other, extending from space to the Earth. In other words, if there is some point out there where you feel a force of, say, a quarter gravity, then there ought to be an entire surface surrounding the globe, sort of like a balloon, where every point on that surface feels that same force of a quarter of a gravity. Now that surface that's coincident with sea level, that's a special case known as the geoid. Geoid is what the shape of the Earth would be if it was covered by water, it had no currents, it was not affected by currents, weather, or tides. The water would all settle to the level of the geoid. You'd have hills in the water surface if there was very dense material underneath, and you'd have dips in it over areas of low density. I think of it as analogous to a contour line, but it shows a surface with a constant value instead of a line with a constant value. So if the technical term for a contour line is actually an iso line, where iso implies that all values are the same, well, the technical term for the surface of constant values is an iso surface. So the geoid is an iso surface. It's also really complicated to work with, unfortunately. It's not quite as complex as the true topographic surface of the Earth, but it's still pretty rough. It's a neat thing, though. It's, uh, this map shows you how the geoid changes across the surface of the planet. You might notice that there's an area of real low density uh, south of India, or area of real high density north of Australia. And that means the actual surface of the ocean rises by almost 200 meters as you go from one point to the next. So it's a pretty interesting thing. And, you know, we don't usually deal with geoids much in GIS, but most GPS systems do have an option to use the geoid when you're calculating elevation. You know, so elevation is elevation above what, right? And if you think of it as elevation above mean sea level, then you're using the geoid. Um, there's other options, though, and, and, and I'll show you that in just a sec. So the problem is that the Earth is not a simple shape. It does not fit any simple mathematical model. It's almost a sphere, but it's not quite. You know, the Earth's rotation makes it sort of bulge out on the equator a little bit. And actually, the North and South Poles are about 22 kilometers closer to the center of the Earth than the equator. So it, it bulges out about that much. Now, the Earth is actually a little bit bigger on the southern hemisphere than the northern hemisphere, but eh, not really very much. But this means that we could model it with a, with a mathematical model that described like a pear shape. But even this is really kind of complicated to work with. Now, when I say complicated to work with, what I'm talking about is the computer having to have to project on the fly. You know, it takes this data and it's projecting it just to make it onto your flat monitor, right? So if it was having to, to project the entire complex shape of the planet every time you moved your mouse, it, it just wouldn't work. What you need is something really simple, a model that describes the Earth in very simple terms. And how do we do that? So yes, we need something very mathematically simple. Topography is way too complex. The geoid, while cool, is also too complex. Even this pear-shaped thing is too complex. We need a very simple mathematical model, something that can you can define it with only a few variables. Now, the simplest one would be a sphere. Sphere, you only need one variable, right? A radius. I mean, a sphere is basically a definition of a constant distance from a single point, so it just takes that one variable, that one radius distance to define it. A sphere would work well to model the planet from. It would be pretty easy to project from a sphere onto a flat surface. And we do use the sphere sometimes. Works pretty well for global scale mapping. So if you're mapping the entire planet, you can use a sphere as the mathematical model. Now, it, it doesn't capture this 14-mile this, uh, expansion of the equator, and that does have an impact when, when we're wanting to take really precise measurements of areas and distances. So it fails on that point. And to try and get it a little better, we usually use a slightly flattened sphere. Still simple enough to be useful. It's, uh, and I'll show you that in a sec. But, and it is more precise and accurate than simply using a sphere. The particular slightly flattened sphere we use is called an oblate ellipsoid. And in GIS, we also call this a spheroid. In GIS, these terms are interchangeable. I emphasize that in GIS, these terms are interchangeable. If 
because I have found that if you go down to the math department and you want to discuss spheroids, they don't know what you're talking about. But they do know what an oblate ellipsoid is. So understand that they mean the same thing. So what is an oblate ellipsoid? It starts with an ellipse. It's a 3D object that is constructed from a two-dimensional ellipse. An ellipse is a mathematical shape that is defined by two variables. We call them the semi-minor axis and the semi-major axis. Now I have some other variables down here uh, that just to tell you about them, because when you read about spheroids, you often read about uh, measures describing the spheroid, and they often talk about the flattening and the eccentricity of a spheroid. So I, I want you to know what they are. Um, they're, they're both based on the semi-minor and semi-major axes. You can see that flattening is a minus b over a, eccentricity is a squared minus b squared over a squared. All right, uh, be clear, we're not going to use any math in this class. We're not going to be generating ellipsoids ourselves. I just want you to know what these are so you'll have seen them. You know, it's kind of weird about this flattening. Flattening seems like a pretty straightforward measure there, doesn't it? You never read the actual flattening value. They always talk about one over flattening. So uh, I don't know why. You know, why didn't they just start with that in the first place? But no, they don't. So you often see one over flattening, and you also see eccentricity reported to describe an ellipse. All right, so here's the ellipse. How do we turn that into an ellipsoid? We just rotate that ellipse around the minor axis. Makes a shape, looks a little like a squashed sphere, and so it does a pretty decent job of modeling the shape of the planet with a pretty simple shape. Only two variables, and this can also be easily projected onto a flat surface. Okay, so this doesn't have much to do with GIS, but I just want you to know about it. And you know how it goes. You, know, you go to a party, you start bragging about your oblate ellipsoids, and next thing you know, some goodwill hunting type comes up and wants to know why you're so hung up on oblate and why not? And why aren't you using your prolate ellipsoids? What about the triaxial? Well, to avoid that embarrassment, I just want you to know what they are. A prolate ellipsoid is the same concept as an oblate, except it's rotated around the long axis instead of the short one sort of looks like a football. And then there is such a thing as a triaxial ellipsoid. There isn't any rotations here. It's actually defined by three different values. It has a semi-minor, semi-major, and another one too. And you know, basically an ellipsoid is anything that if you took a slice out of it, you get an ellipse. That's a reasonable definition of an ellipsoid. And anyway, we use the oblate ellipsoid, which is the ellipse rotated around the semi-minor axis, so it looks sort of like a squashed sphere, and therefore is a pretty decent model for the shape of the planet itself. All right, trivia question, now that we're discussing oblate ellipsoids. We had the Mississippi River. It starts up in Minnesota. It's about 1,500 feet elevation, and it flows down to the ocean in the Gulf of Mexico. So... Clearly, as it travels that route, it drops 1,500 feet in elevation, right? So which point is farther away from the center of the Earth? Where it starts up in Minnesota or where it exits into the Gulf of Mexico? would I be asking if the answer was the intuitive one, right? No, nope. the source is 3,956 miles away from the center of the Earth, and where it comes out of the Gulf of Mexico is 3,960 miles. So where it comes out of the Gulf of Mexico, it's actually four miles farther away from the center of the planet than where it starts. It gets further away from the center of the Earth as it flows downhill, which I think is just kind of a neat little piece of trivia there. Okay, so we've got the ellipsoid now, but the ellipsoid all by itself is actually not enough to model the shape of the Earth. So because of the Earth's non-symmetrical shape, we also need to know how to position the ellipsoid so that it best conforms to the shape of the Earth. So for example, consider this red shape here to be the Earth. It's mostly circular, but it's not perfect. We anchor the ellipsoid to the Earth in some manner. The ellipsoid, combined with how that ellipsoid is anchored to the Earth, together form what we call the datum. Now in this example, notice how the ellipsoid does not conform equally well to all parts of the Earth's surface. Fits pretty well a little north and south of the equator, but it is pretty far off near the poles. 
So therefore we define different datums depending on what part of the Earth we want the ellipsoid to conform to. We can rotate and resize the ellipsoid and we anchor it to the surface of the planet in such a way that the surface of the ellipsoid most closely matches the surface of the planet in the area we're interested in. And historically we've done this differently for different regions of the planet. So for example, the North American datum of 1927 uses an ellipsoid of a certain size, and it's named the Clark 1866 ellipsoid. They've oriented and positioned it so that it is anchored to a spot in Kansas. Now, other datums for other parts of the world use different ellipsoids with different orientations and anchored at different parts of the world. Unfortunately, the size of the ellipsoid and the method of anchoring it to the planet generally makes it work well in one area but causes distortion in other areas. In the last few decades, we've become a lot more interested in datums that can be used globally. <clears throat> so, for example, the GPS system is used globally and therefore requires a global datum. And they call this the WGS 1984 or the World Geodetic Survey of 1984. You'll run into WGS 84 a lot. And there, another one you'll run into a lot is NAD 83, the North American datum of 1983. These, it's actually pretty close to WGS-84. The spheroids are really very close to each other. Uh, there's kind of interesting trivia about NAD-83, though. It is designed to adapt over time. It's designed to fit the North American continent really well. But since the continent rotates, it's on a tectonic plate, the NAD-83 datum is designed to rotate slowly along with the North American continental plate, which is kind of cool. That means every 10 or 15 years they come out with a new flavor of it that just adjusts it just a little bit. WGS-84 stays stable and static. Another interesting thing about both NAD-83 and WGS-84 is that they no, they're, they're no longer defined according to some point on the planet's surface. Now they anchor it to the planet by the actual center of mass of the planet. It, you know, it's a slightly different definition. The net result is not really that much different to you as a, as a user of them. But it did lead to GIS people just getting really happy about saying that NAD83 were not in Kansas anymore. We all got that on our coffee mug several years ago. Now, it's important to understand that when you give the latitude and longitude coordinates of some location, those coordinates really just say where that location is on one particular ellipsoid. And the ellipsoid is slightly different for every datum. And this means the actual spot on the ground that corresponds with a set of latitude and longitude coordinates will be different for different datums. Okay, now this gets us to the geographic coordinate system. Now this is defined by several things, the ellipsoid or the spheroid that approximates the shape of the Earth plus the datum, which is how it's anchored to the Earth, and then we, then we finally add the actual latitude-longitude coordinate system over that datum. Now defining this coordinate system mainly involves defining where the prime meridian is. Prime meridian means the point of zero degrees longitude. Coordinate system is then defined to range from negative 180 west of that line to 180 east of that line and 90 degrees north and south. Now, not all geographic coordinate systems use the same prime meridian, and this is a surprise to some people. Probably shouldn't be, you know. If you live in Egypt or Paris or Indonesia, you know, why should you use England as the zero point of your coordinate system? And in fact, there are there are geographic coordinate systems where zero degrees longitude is in Jakarta or in Cairo or in Paris. However, pretty much any geographic coordinate system we will encounter in our typical work here in the United States will define the prime meridian at Greenwich, England. So what do geographic coordinate systems mean to you? Now it's tempting to get confused by all the datum and ellipsoid variations and just hope it makes no difference in your life so you can ignore it. Unfortunately, you cannot rely on this. So this picture is trying to convince you. We got three points and all three points have exactly the same latitude and longitude values. However, each point uses a different geographic coordinate system. Notice that NAD 83 and WGS 84 are actually pretty close to each other. NAD 27 is always the real outlier. Imagine that you need to go to resample a location out in the woods and somebody gives you the coordinates using, say, NAD 27. You enter those coordinates into your GPS and you head out into the woods. 
However, your GPS is using WGS 1984, not NAD 27. This means your GPS will take you to a point 66 meters to the west of where you want to go. And this this is the, the, the error in Flagstaff, so this is what would happen if you're near Flag. Now, you may never find that point, especially if there's lots of vegetation and the point is poorly marked on the ground. And trust me on this, I speak from experience, and you probably will too. You, you, you're, you're given a set of coordinates from some thing that was surveyed decades ago and you're assigned to go get a new survey. Well, you're happy because they marked that location on the ground by pounding rebar into it, but you go out there, the rebar may only be a few inches above the ground and 66 meters away from where you expect to find it and deep in a New Mexican locust thicket. And you'll be lucky if you ever find it. And this exact situation is really common these days, and we're still kind of transitioning between older NAD 27 data to newer NAD 83 or WGS 1984 data. And unfortunately, the really old data, they don't even say what, ge what geographic coordinate system it uses. Uh, we often naively assume that the data uses the same geographic coordinate system we're using now, and we wonder why we can't ever find those old survey points using our GPS. Now, the biggest uh, geographic coordinate system and datum related issue that we usually deal with here in the United States is the difference between WGS84 and NAD27, just because we still have so much of that old NAD27 data floating around. Now, this slide will show you the difference in meters between these two coordinate systems across the United States. Uh, what this means is that if you get coordinates and you think they're in WGS84, but they're actually in NAD 27, this says how far off you're going to be on the ground when you go out and look for it. So ranges from around 66 meters in flag, goes up to over 90 meters in California. If you happen to be working in Chicago, that seems to be the one place in the United States, that seems to be the one place in the United States where they line up, so you just got lucky there. Okay, let's go over a couple of review points and then, then we'll wind up this video. Okay, first off, the Earth is curved, and so we use projections to transform those spatial features that lie on the Earth onto some flat surface. We choose a projection based on whether we want to preserve shape, area, direction, or distance. Projected coordinates are based on an underlying geographic coordinate system. All projected coordinates are based on some underlying geographic system. And this geographic coordinate system is the coordinate system that lays over the datum. The datum is the spheroid and the way it's anchored to the planet. And then the geographic coordinate system sets a prime meridian, which is zero degrees longitude, and then sets coordinates in degrees latitude and longitude. All projected coordinate systems have an associated geographic coordinate system. And any single geographic coordinate system can have an endless number of projected coordinate systems that are projected from it. Datums are defined by an ellipsoid plus how that ellipsoid is anchored to the planet. Now let's mention some ArcGIS terminology just because it can be confusing sometimes. In ArcGIS, the terms spatial reference and coordinate system, they generally mean the same thing. They're any coordinate system, geographic or projected, based on any ellipsoid and datum. Now, I and many others often use the term projection and projected coordinate system interchangeably, but this is incorrect. A projection is just the method you use to transform geographic coordinates into projected coordinates. And it's basically, a, a, it's basically an equation that converts from one, one unit to another. Thing is, you can give that equation different parameters, and it's still the same equation. This is why there's the UTM projection, but there are 60 different UTM zones. There's only one projection, but you give it different parameters, you can come up with 60 different projected coordinate systems. And another point, you can use the same projection equation on different datums. That's why you can have the UTM projection that projects from NAD83. It can also have a UTM in WGS84 and in NAD27. So you can have 60 different UTM zones projected from each of these different geographic coordinate systems. In ArcGIS, the terms datum and horizontal datum generally mean the same thing. They specifically are referring to an ellipsoid and how that ellipsoid is anchored to the planet. 
The term geographic coordinate system refers to the coordinate system defined over the datum, the curved ellipsoid, based on where the prime meridian is. And the terms geographic coordinate system and datum are often used interchangeably, but technically they should not be. Remember, the datum is the ellipsoid and how it's anchored to the planet. The geographic system is what you get once you draw a coordinate system over that datum. Now, just for your information, there's also a vertical datum that we won't get into, and it refers to how we define our elevation values, and this could be from the spheroid or the geoid, and where we set the zero elevation point at. As of ArcGIS 10.8.2, ArcGIS recognizes over 7,000 projected coordinate systems, almost 1,200 geographic coordinate systems, and any of these can be modified into an infinite number of variations. All right, so in the, next, in the next video, we're going to go over how you actually use these in ArcGIS. So I think we'll stop here for now.